thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Brock. I'm a junior here at Northwestern leading the real estate club. Um, I'm going into real estate acquisitions, going to be um, at Morgan Stanley this summer. Um, and I really do like the industry. I hope to stay long term. Um, and I'm really glad David he is here today to, uh, to come and answer some questions for us. Um, so, you know, I checked out David's website, uh, Camp A Capital, and it's always so great to see when you have the big landscape pictures and, you know, very sparse information. It's kind of like when you go to a hedge fund and it's like, it looks like they spent five minutes putting it up. It's like, you want to know about what we do, you come talk to us. So um, that's always a good first sign. Um, I do love the website. Um, so David, if you could walk us through your background a little bit, uh, starting with your time at Northwestern, your previous employment, and what you do now, that would be really great. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules so I could visit with you. Uh, Brock, thank you for looking at our website. Now I know that the annual fee of $9.99 is worth it. I did everything I could not to do a website, and my team insisted that I have one to make it look professional. And I said, that's fine. We're not going to put anything on it. Does that work? And so that was uh, the first meeting when we started the company. Uh, yes, uh, I will take you through a, a very brief uh, career trajectory for me so you have a little flavor of who you're talking to this morning and why because it uh, was not all that long ago, I sound like an old person, that I was in your uh, shoes. And uh, I was a history major at Northwestern. I graduated in 1992. I knew I wanted to go into business, real estate specifically. I had absolutely no clue in the world how to do that. So I applied for a teaching job uh, at, at uh, a private school uh, in the Midwest. I applied for a uh, job in Washington, D.C. with the senator of my state. I got both of those. And then I applied for the equivalent of a Peace Corps program uh, in uh, the Middle East. And uh, everyone told me, whatever I do, don't do the Peace Corps program. And that's exactly what I did. So the year after I graduated, I went and worked and um, did a lot of volunteer work with with immigrants to in, in Israel at the time and uh, was there for about 15 months. And still with a burning desire to go into business, I decided I was qualified to do absolutely nothing. So I went to law school. Uh, everybody in my family are lawyers. No one listens to you at our dinner table unless you have a JD. And so I went to law school and I hated pretty much the entire experience. Though my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife of 23 years, that was a good thing. That was like the only good thing that happened to me in law school. Uh, so I went to law school and I graduated and I still had this desire to go into business and finance. The, the idea was starting to form of how I could actually accomplish this. And uh, I decided to move to New York City without a job at the time because no one in their right mind would hire uh, a history major from Northwestern with a year of Peace Corps experience and three years of law school and a finance job. Uh, my father insisted that I take the bar exam, thinking there's no way in the world I don't end up being a lawyer, which I did. And for the record, I passed, if anyone's curious, because New York bar is super hard, and I actually passed it. Uh, but I ended up never practicing law. When I got to New York, I went after my career in a very serious and determined way. And I ultimately, well, it didn't take that long, but it took a few months, and I landed a job as a... Um, as an analyst at uh, an investment bank, JP Morgan. And that really started my career in business. I spent seven years as an analyst. Well, I started as an associate, then I got promoted to VP and whatever, but I was there for seven years in investment banking. That's like a hundred years of your life. Brock, you're totally screwed if you're going to Morgan Stanley, but let me know how that works out. And uh, I'm just kidding. Acquisitions, not REIV. I'm okay. 
I'm just kidding. Uh -huh. uh, and um, and it was uh, an incredible experience. It was uh, very, very difficult in a lot of ways that we can talk about here today in terms of what skills I had and what skills I didn't and what I needed to do to bridge that gap, which was significant and steep. I was there for seven and a half years and I looked around the place and I said, I do not wanna be any of these people when I grow up. And that felt like a time to leave. Uh, I looked at a bunch of different opportunities and ultimately decided on uh, an opportunity investing on, in myself. And I uh, did what I don't know anyone else did, uh, does typically, I left and I started my own company. And I did it uh, with no track record, no money, no balance sheet, no resources, just a idea that uh, I've seen what a big fancy office building with marble uh, lobby and drivers that take you home at night and meals that they pay for you at 12 o'clock at night looks like. And I thought if I'm gonna work this hard for the rest of my life, I should do it for myself. And I did. And I started a real estate investment company. It, it's a vertically integrated company that buys, develops, operates and manages uh, apartment buildings across the country. We, we do a lot of mixed use as well, but our focus is really on urban environments, uh, like in Evanston, for example, neighborhoods that are anchored by major medical centers and major universities, where the supply demand imbalance is structurally favorable to a landlord, and that those uh, properties are almost irreversible. And we can talk a little bit more about my business and my investment strategy, if you'd like to be really bored and hear about that. But I've been doing that for now 23 years. Uh, we have put together a portfolio of just over 10,000 apartments. We have about 500,000 square feet of commercial real estate. We do ground up development. We do adaptive use, historic renovations. We buy land. We operate a portfolio as well. We have a big management company. And it uh, was pretty exciting starting my own company. Uh, it was terrifying. Thank God I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, my wife was pregnant at the time, so it was an incredible conversation with my mother-in-law. And we can also talk about that if anyone wants to hear about that conversation. But it's been a really rewarding career for me and in a lot of ways, but, but deeply satisfying in the most important ways uh, in terms of realizing setting challenges for yourself and, and attempting to realize what your full potential is as a human being. Uh, that's as a leader, that's as a business person, that's as a citizen of a community uh, and a country. Uh, but it is also fundamentally looking in the mirror every morning and understanding if you have what it takes. And uh, well, I'm really proud of what we've done and I have a great team and they mostly get it done and I just do calls like this during the day. So. That's a quick overview of me. I, I, I'm happy to explore any of those topics that may be of interest because there's a lot there and I recognize that. Um, one thing that I will say that might be of interest is when I had my first interview to get that job at the bank that I just described to you, it was several rounds over several weeks, probably months at the time. And I, they brought me in for a super day of interviews, which is like one of these horrible days where you go in at 8.30 and you interview to, with people till like four o'clock and it's impossible not to screw it up. And I was having a pretty good day. And my last interview was with the guy who ran the entire department in real estate. And it turns out he's a Northwestern grad. So I'm like, oh, this is sweet. I am so golden here. I mean, I've made it through the day and I've got this interview. We sat down, we had a great meeting. It was supposed to be like 20 minute meet and greet. It was like an hour and I, I really felt really good. And as the meeting is winding down, he says to me, David, it was so great to meet you. I've so enjoyed this. It is really a shame that we're not gonna work together, but I wish you great luck and keep in touch. And if there's anything I can do, let me know. And I said, oh, that's a really weird signal because I really thought we were having a good day here and maybe one of your colleagues had said something. And at that point I was like, I'm just going for broke here because it sounds like it's over anyways. 
So I said, what, what is it about our meeting or any feedback that you've heard that, that would lead you not to hire me at this point? And he said, oh, you have everything that you need to be successful here, and I would love to hire you, except that you have a law background. And the fact that you went to law school, lawyers are trained to be risk adverse. And this is a business job where you have to learn how to take risk and learn about risk and measure risk. And there are all kinds of risks. So I could never have someone work with work for me who doesn't understand risk and is afraid of it. And I said, how much more time do you have? Because we're going to have a longer conversation here. And we ended up sitting down. We ended up, we ended up continuing the conversation, sitting down for probably, I don't remember, but I'll say 45 minutes or whatever. And I basically told him he was making a terrible mistake and he didn't understand me. And he's a horrible interviewer. If he doesn't understand who he is, who I am, then he's asking bad questions and he's got to fix that. And here are the things that he didn't ask about me that he should have to know more about me. So he should hire me. And I ended up working with that guy for a very long time. So when you have nothing to lose and you have no job in New York City and rent is due in a couple of days, you just do stupid stuff. And it worked out well for me. Uh, and it was very hard after that fact. But the fact that this guy had a Northwestern connection, we, we still laugh about it to this day because it's a funny story. But it really wasn't funny at the time because <laughs> I, I was going home to my fiance telling her that I struck out again. But um, that was that's my quick background. That's 15 minutes of background. So I'll stop rambling. And uh, now you know who you're talking to a little bit more, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so long career, successful, Super Day horror story, kids somewhere in there. Everything sounds great, but I want to know a little bit more about where it all started at Northwest. Okay, well, I guess it all started when you were born, but Northwestern was somewhere in the early beginning area. Could you tell us about any formative experiences you had in either a class with a professor, club, anything like that? Sure. So. Uh, I, by way of background, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, and I loved the idea of going to a Big Ten school in the Midwest, and I loved history. I had a great history teacher in high school, and it, it just, it really connected with me uh, in, in a deep way. Uh, you know, today, you all have decisions that I didn't have then because there are so many undergraduate business schools. And we should talk about that a little this morning in terms of the trade-offs of a vocational training at a Wharton or a Ross or somewhere like that uh, versus the arts and sciences degree that you have you get at Northwestern. And what I would implore you and, and tell you to be demanding of is to uh, pursue the enriching career you all are getting uh, as Weinberg students at Northwestern. It's incomparable and it's invaluable. Yeah, uh, it, it, you know, I can, I'll expand more on that in a few minutes, but to your, the heart of your question, Brock, um, I had several uh, formative experiences in my Northwestern career. I will tell you that for me, uh, finding an, an area of academia that was of interest was um, universe opening. Uh, it, it, it opened me to a world of inquiry and rigor and study and reading and exploration that was deeper than anything I had ever had. And that really spoke to um, sort of the intellectual curiosity that is part of my genome uh, in some way. And I was very close with a couple of professors uh, and I just got very involved in my studies. That was deeply transformative. I also was involved in a couple of organizations uh, at Northwestern I was very involved in dance marathon. And by my senior year, I, I ran the dancers. So I, I really was involved with that and had an enormously fulfilling experience. And I remember the, after my senior year, we had broken the record for like the third year in the row of money we were raising. And I remember saying to somebody, we just set the all-time record. It will never be broken again. No one's ever going to touch this. We raised $250,000. So I love seeing the emails I get from Northwestern uh, DM every year now that they're over a million dollars, making us uh, all look like chump change, uh, which is wonderful how that organization was in, in, uh, has, has involved. So, you know, that deep socialization I had with uh, my colleague, my fellow students, 
and the intellectual rigor I had uh, around my studies were really impactful to me while I was there. What would you say is something that you learned on the sell side in Regal that you couldn't otherwise have learned on the buy side? On the sell side, you mean in my career or you mean yeah. at school? Yeah, yeah, in your career. Okay, we're jumping to my career. That's fine. We can jump around. Um, what I would tell you about <laughs> the sell side, I, I think about it a little differently. I'm going to reframe your question. I would say there is a very big difference between being an agent and a principal. When you are the equity, let alone equity that you invest for other people, so the classic OPM, other people's money, or your own personal equity, there is a level of terror and scrutiny and rigor and responsibility that is unlike anything you could ever get as an agent, uh, as somebody who is working in a service role. Not that that is bad. I did it for seven years. It's incredibly fulfilling. It was incredibly rewarding. I can't function in my own career now as a principal without that entire industry uh, from lawyers to bankers to um, advisors to consultants like uh, in the environmental space, in the property condition space, engineers. I, we couldn't function without them. But the, the level of responsibility and rigor that you get as an owner is incomparable to the experience as an agent, even though the hours may be similar. Interesting. And I guess expanding on that, what's the difference between working on the buy side and owning your own shop on the buy side? Because obviously there's an aspect of team management and um, generating deal flow that wouldn't otherwise be there. Look, I, I can only speak to my life as an investment banker, which was like five centuries ago. But what I will tell you was that, you know, there is a lot of fishing in that industry. You, you are hunting for deal flow, as you're alluding to. Every January 1st in that industry, the scoreboard has zero oh, points on it. Anytime that, like, and you've, you've like got that. to work incredibly hard to create value for your clients in deal flow that they want to do. It could be buying a company, selling a company, buying assets, selling assets, capital raising, capital formation on equity or debt. That stuff is very, very hard. It takes a lot of work, but, but your, your hit rate is so low. I mean, I, I am really good at presentations because I did thousands of them over seven and a half years at JP Morgan, because very few deal, very few pitches ever turned into deals. You know, you read about deals every day in the newspaper and you think they're so plentiful. They're not. There are a hundred pitches that happen for every deal. It's 1% of stuff that happens. It's very hard business. On the principal side, you quantify, well, let me say you value your time very differently. Every minute is priceless because it's all on you. Everything that you have to do has to be something of value. Otherwise, why are you doing it? The other thing is you have to be the best at what you are doing. Otherwise, why are you doing it? Someone else should do it. Or somebody, <laughs> you shouldn't be raising money from other people. They should give it to someone else. You know, there is a... Um, standard that I hold myself to as an owner and principal because of how I value how I use my time. Interesting. Okay. And how would you describe the environment today, the macro environment in terms of interest rates, inflation, if you could break that down a little bit, just on uh, on a broader scope for, for the members of the call who aren't so familiar? Sure. I don't know how much folks follow this who are on the call today, but the uh, macroeconomic environment has obviously shifted tremendously in the last 12 months. We had a very long stretch of time in this country, 10 or 12 years, depending on how you measure it, where the cost of money was very low and zero for a very long period of time. That leads to very reckless behavior in terms of uh, capital formation 
and in asset valuations, especially in real estate, which are leverage, leveraged investments. So when you can borrow money at very low rates, it inflates values and it leads to, uh, in many cases, very, very bad outcomes. So you have to be disciplined, you have to trust your underwriting, and you have to know that in environments like the one we used to be in <laughs> or no longer in, uh, you got to be really careful and you need many, many layers of protection when you make an investment because a lot's not going to go your way or the way you hope. Uh, I, a lot of times I talk to investors who ask me about our underwriting models and I tell them the only thing I can guarantee is that this model is not right because I've never done a deal that ever comes out to the pro forma. Usually, it, hopefully it turns out better. Uh, that's a good model. Uh, that's a good outcome. It doesn't always happen that way. Uh, the current environment has changed. I'm sure everyone's aware of uh, the pricing pressure that we call inflation that has emerged in the last 12 months. That is creating uh, a disinflationary environment at the moment where you still see inflation, but it's, it's, it's growing at a much slower rate. Uh, but it has changed the world dramatically as the Fed has raised interest rates. And so that's changing valuation. Uh, banks and credit uh, providers are pulling back uh, dramatically. And the cost of that capital is much higher. What is interesting for private investors like me is that this is almost a dream scenario. Because what it does is it eliminates people who really don't know what they're doing in this space because the money was so cheap and they could raise money and do things. And people who are in the public markets who have enormous pressure either from a stock price or large pension fund investors or endowments and so forth who are having a lot of stress in different parts of their portfolio. So they may own office, they may own industrial, they may own retail, they may own apartments. And because those other areas have enormous stress, say office, they're re reallocating capital across the real estate investment portfolio. And, and they're selling a lot of their multifamily real estate to cover uh, and that rebalanced their portfolio. And so that is creating significant opportunities in my business right now. We are seeing assets that are being uh, available for purchase that were not available in the last five or seven years at prices that are far better than they would I would have ever dreamed of in the last five or seven years. So we are, uh, you can't see my track shoes on today, but we have laced up our track shoes and we are sprinting towards opportunities because what you will find in business is that moments of volatility create opportunities. You need to know where to look, you need to know how to structure it, and you need to know how to protect your capital. But this is a moment of opportunity for people like me. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think to some degree the, the markets you're focused on, the urban environments, neighborhoods that are anchored by major medical centers or universities, is that somehow insulating to you um, in the recessionary environment, or do you think you're being impacted um, just as much as, as anyone else? Well, yes to everything you just said. Uh, let me expand on that. Uh, you can't escape the larger environment. We're all operating in the same environment. So in that regard, the pressures that are on everyone are on us too. I'm, I'm in the middle of negotiating a loan with se uh, several lending groups right now, and the terms are far different than they've been for several years. So we can't ignore that, but we operate differently because of that. To the heart of your question, my investment strategy is completely predicated on one fundamental aspect that you don't know about me that's a secret, but I'm going to share it with everybody. And that is I am a coward. Okay. And everybody thinks entrepreneurs are risk-taking, cowboys, swashbuckling, crazy people. My experience is that good entrepreneurs are very conservative and they, they learn how to manage risk. And so my entire business is predicated on investing in supply-constrained markets where there is no additional new supply, where the prospect of new supply is very difficult because either the land is not available or the cost of the land or the cost of construction makes redevelopment or new development prohibitive. So we are, sorry about that, we are um, entirely focused on these urban infill neighborhoods, even though they're very difficult to penetrate because of the insulation, Brock, that you suggest 
uh, they provide. It is like standing under a protective umbrella because these neighborhoods are, well, first of all, they're very robust in stronger macroeconomic environments because of the environment that, um, because of the environment that, uh, that, 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 that they participate in with federal grants, state grants, NIH grants, so on and so forth. There's a lot of capital, a lot of job formation, a lot of household formation that is very important to my business that gets generated by uh, medical centers and universities. That's the first thing. The other side of it is in downturns and more modest uh, uh, economic environments or recessions, they're very stabilizing. These are places that maintain their employees, maintain their job, maintain wage growth, and so forth. Very stable environments with very sophisticated customer base. You know, when I think about who's living in my buildings, I have to design a building for who that customer is. And we're constantly assessing who's going to live in a particular building. And we, we, we tailor our design specifically to the needs of that customer. But it, very important to me is we're picking these urban environments because these are sophisticated shoppers, sophisticated customers who have high incomes and have wage growth. So in my business, it's about growth. And um, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't have growth, um, you know, it's very hard to do well with leveraged investments. So the idea that a tenant in my building is not getting above average wage growth, it's a fiction for me to think that I would ever get above average rent growth. There's just no way. So if you had a tenant who had, um, you know, a minimum wage job and they're getting, you know, modest rent, uh, wage increases, if at all, there's no way they can afford a higher rent increase. And so we're, we're very, very hyper-focused on these in, in, in uh, neighborhoods for all kinds of reasons, but, but mostly to give us the best chance to succeed. Okay, okay. Let's talk a little bit about the debt side. You mentioned interest rates. Uh, Risk-free rate was zero for a while, went up very quickly. Um, and this is causing a lot of problems. You mentioned, you know, that you, your business model is somewhat insulated, but everyone's impacted by the macro environment to some degree. Um, talk about how you're able to leverage these deals. How have competitors been able to do this or maybe not? And, um, you know, ha have deals been penciling even, um, even with the insulated business model? Okay, so you asked a lot of really um, complicated and good questions there. So let me try to unpack that. So there are a lot of people who can't get loans today because lenders have pulled back significantly. So when there is a credit squeeze, that ripples through the entire system. That's good for my business because we can get capital. We can get loans today. Now, what has happened is that the structure of those loans have become much more conservative, much tighter. So where we used to get on a construction loan comfortably 65 to 70 percent senior leverage, and I'm, I'm just going to ignore the more esoteric debt products uh, in the uh, capital market state. If you want to talk about mezzanine or preferred equity, I'm happy to have that conversation. I, I don't... Um, borrow from those providers because I don't have to. Uh, and so, you know, that's a whole other world where you can lever up at, at great cost, but I avoid that uh, like the plague. So, um, so I'm talking about senior leverage right now. Uh, that construction loan or that renovation loan for a, for a building that we're completely rehabbing which used to be 65% loan to cost. And then when you're done, you've created values, maybe 60% loan to value uh, upon stabilization. That is now probably 50%. So when you think about your underwriting and your model, you now have 10 to 15% more equity. And if you're finance people and understand cost of capital, your equity capital is far more expensive than your debt. And now your return profile has changed. And the way to offset that is two things. Spend less money on your rehab. Well, we're in an inflationary environment and costs are spiking, uh, which you probably all know, uh, which means you're not going to lower your costs on redevelopment. So the only other lever to play is to lower the purchase price of an asset. 
And so that's what you're starting to see matriculate in the in the in the markets where where values are coming down. I mean, I you probably saw that Blackstone sold <laughs> in the same day Blackstone announced that they are selling to uh, an office portfolio in Southern California for a $36 million loss uh, that they bought in 2014. They also announced that they are closing on their largest ever real estate private equity fund of $33 billion. And just for the record, between Blackstone and me, we have $33 billion. So, you know, it's, it's an incredible environment where people are um, still willing to put out money and looking for great in um, re great returns, but the investing criteria has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. Right. So back to Camp A Capital, um, you decide you want to become an investor. You want to invest in real estate. Functionally, how does that work, right? You don't have any money. You have to bring in other investors called limited partners. Um, and in order to convince them, they have to one, believe in the thesis and two, want the returns that you're offering, right? So I guess question one is, um, how did you go about that capital raising process? And question two is, how did you market your fund with, uh, with which return metrics roughly? Okay, so when I started uh, my company, we did not raise a fund initially. Uh, the first five deals that I did was uh, rate capital raise equity raising on a deal by deal basis. And I sat in a conference room with a yellow legal pad, which that's how we used to do it, and a pen. And I wrote down every single person I had ever met in my life and called every single one of them to try to lose money with me. And what's extraordinary about that experience is all the people that you think are going to give you money are not giving you money at least in the gap world i don't i won't speak to all of you but in my experience that's what happened and all these people that you don't think are going to give you money but you call anyways because you call everybody they say things like this happened to me many times you're starting a business you didn't call me i'm taking you to lunch tomorrow meet me at the such and such pizza place or whatever and come into the city or like whatever. I mean, it's it's people who have started business and have traveled down this path understand how difficult it is. But now we're talking about starting a business. That this is a different world of going to a JP Morgan and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my my wife has an expression that if you start a business, like you have to get up and eat glass every day. That's what it feels like because it's that hard, and you have to live with more rejection than any human being should ever subject themselves to because that's what it is it's just 99 out of 100 rejections uh that's capital raising that's looking at deals and trying to buy them because you don't get them you find something that works then you get outbid i mean it's just it's just super super hard and so we you know i came up with a strategy which is i described to you a few moments ago which is I should invest in these supply constrained urban markets. The other thing that I did that I didn't describe to you was we picked markets that were non-institutional. I wanted to be in markets that had all the characteristics I just described to you, but didn't have institutional competition. So I will tell you that one of my biggest markets is uh, our competitor on the South side, uh, which was in Hyde Park. You know, we bought 5,000 apartments in Hyde Park. There are only 14,000 of them. So we became the largest landlord in that market. And we did it because people think about the South Side Chicago in pejorative ways. They don't understand how dynamic and vibrant it is. And for us, that was an incredible arbitrage because everyone would say, Chicago, sure, the Loop, uh, Wrigleyville, <laughs> Lincoln Park. Yeah, let's go. And we said, well, we have a different Chicago in mind. And they were like, are you out of your mind? And most people didn't invest with us. And the ones who did, I think, were rewarded uh, for giving us a shot. The last piece I'll say to your question, Brock, is I think when people started, you know, they gave us money that they were absolutely sure I was going to lose. So they were giving me like little crumbs, you know, off the table. And for me, 
Doesn't matter what anyone gave me. It was enormous. It was an enormous sense of responsibility. I can tell you the thing that I lose sleep over the most in my life, even today, is staring at the ceiling at three o'clock in the morning, knowing how many people depend on my decision making, both investors and employees. So uh, it, it, starting a business isn't for everyone. We would have to have a much longer conversation about that piece of my life, but I did it. And um, for me, it, 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 I'm glad I did. Okay, we're gonna go into one last question and then hand it off to um, the other members of the call. Um, if you could only put your money in one submarket for the next 10 years, what would that submarket be and what would that property type be? Well, I get asked that question a lot, believe it or not. And my whole career is essentially an answer to that question. And the joke that I tell investors is I have only come up with four ideas in my entire life and I'm 53. You know, like I, I never wanted to become equity residential and invest in 30 markets across the country because my feeling was that their returns would always revert to the mean. Of course, big, sophisticated, could, uh, unlimited capital, um, liquidity. My approach was, yeah, you're going to get a hyper-focused strategy. You're going to be illiquid, but you're going to get a premium return. So when people would say, why would I give you money instead of Blackstone or Equity Residential? I used to say, you, you shouldn't. <laughs> Those guys are great. Uh, but if you're allocating, then you should give most to them and a little to me and let me prove myself to you. And when I come back, you'll give me a little more. And that's how I built a very long track record. Um, in terms of what I'm doing today, it's the answer to your question. Uh, I have actually come full circle and about five years ago entered uh, the Pittsburgh market. Uh, it is a relatively non-institutional market uh, in terms of capital formation in my sector, which is multifamily. It's got one of the largest and most sophisticated and fastest growing hospital systems in the country called UPMC, which hopefully none of you know anything about this and don't tell anyone. Uh, they have seven universities, two significant universities in Carnegie Mellon University and University of Pittsburgh, which has become a world leader in life sciences. And both of those universities are spinning off unbelievable uh, amount of jobs uh, that are really around professors and grad students that have formed businesses like Duolingo, if you know the language app, for example, that went public last year. Uh, you know, Carnegie Mellon University made $100 million on that IPO, like that kind of investment that universities are now partnering with their incredibly intelligent and capable uh, student body um, is exactly what's happening um, around uh, markets like that. So we are, we're deeply invested in Pittsburgh. If Carnegie Mellon University or the University of Pittsburgh decide to move to Madison, my business strategy is going to be screwed, uh, but that is a, a bet and a risk uh, I've become comfortable with. Thanks, David. Great. David, thank you so much for uh, answering all of these great questions. And Brock, thank you so much for moderating uh, our first half of our portion of our program. Um, we are excited to get into some student questions um, as well. And, and David, you know, as we wait for folks to send in questions, of course, if you want me to, students, if you want me to ask the question for you, send in a private chat to me. If you would like for me to call on you to turn your mic on, you can send in a public chat and I'll call on you. Um, but David, to, to just get us started with our student questions, I know you got into a lot of really great specific questions and answers. Um, but we have about 70% or more of the students on the call today who are either very unfamiliar or somewhat unfamiliar with real estate. And so I'm curious if you can give us, you know, maybe three things that you would love for students to leave the call knowing about the real estate industry. Sure. First of all, thank you for the question. And Brock, thank you for moderating and those great questions. Those, those were tougher than I wanted and expected. So good job. You're going to do great at Morgan Stanley, by the way. Um, so real estate. So first of all, real estate is a very, very, very big industry. There are a lot of things you can do in real estate. You can own and invest in buildings like me. I happen to do it in apartments, uh, but just walk down the street in Evanston and you'll see hospitals and retail stores and office buildings and 
uh, life science centers and industrial warehouses, probably further out, maybe not in Evanston. Um, so there's all kinds of different real estate. Uh, there's also, you know, you can work as a broker, you can work as a banker, you can work in different engineering industries that I touched on earlier. Like the industry is the, I think the largest industry in the country, don't quote me on that, but it's first or second, depending on how you measure it. And so what I would say to students today is that there is enormous opportunity in the real estate space and you don't have to take the risk and do the stuff that I did in my life. You can have a perfectly happy life and career, uh, very fulfilling uh, uh, personally and financially doing all different kinds of things in real estate. So first of all, it's a very huge market. The second thing is, you know, my specific specialty is in apartment building and the reason why I chose that was very intentional because I looked at it and I concluded there's no functional obsolescence to shelter. You know, in other words, I don't know if you've ever read the case study or know of a, this company called Kodak, right? Kodak made cameras. Uh, they were a Fortune 100 company for 150 years. And in the 1990s, someone in the research and development department came into the CEO's office and said, hey, listen, I'm reading about all these articles about these like handheld phones that people are going to have someday. It's like never going to happen, but someday, you know, it might. And so, you know, we should think about putting uh, our cameras in, in phones. And Kodak, which was like one of the top, top companies in the world, said, that's a stupid idea. People care about the quality of their cameras uh, and their photographs, rather. And they're going to only want high quality film and high quality pictures and high quality so forth. And so they did it. And now we all carry around these machines that have like the best cameras ever, not professional cameras, but amazing cameras. So that entire business of owning a camera, completely disintermediated, gone forever, like horse buggies. People, you know, the classic business case, school case is the horse buggies of the early 20th century, you know, before cars, right? So I thought, well, as again, I told you I'm a coward, I don't want to ever be disintermediated. What, do, what is something everyone is going to need forever? And I concluded, housing. Now, it gets a little more nuanced in supply-constrained markets. So the extra step I took was we're going to go be in an urban environments where the prospect of new supply is very limited. But I just say that because when you're thinking about real estate, you have a lot of different choices to make. Industrial has become very popular in the last 10, 15 years because of Amazon. So, you know, you have to think about real estate very broadly. The last thing I'll say to your question, Casey, is that, you know, I'm sure <laughs> it's going to sound stupid. I have, um, I fly on planes every week to meet people and stuff. And on clear days, I look down and you see all these buildings below you. And the, th the thought that I always have is, God, there's a lot of it. And boy, you don't need to own that much of it to have a great life. And so to me, that's sort of the opportunity that you're going after. It's a big opportunity in a big industry. And if you can find a specificity that you can be an expert at, I think you can have a great career. That's great. That's very helpful. Thanks, David. And we have some student questions coming in um, from Amy asking, in such a competitive field, how do you maintain positive relationships with other agents? Moreover, how do you balance kindness and empathy with more aggressive assertive tactics necessary for the field? Amy asked that question. Mm -hmm. Amy, whoever you are, that's a great question. <laughs> um, what I would say to that is you, I would say this to any college uh, student right now. I would say that you should be demanding of yourself and the environment you expect to work in. And what I mean by that is you should define for yourself a set of values that are important to you. And you, I assume you already live by them to ask such a thoughtful, insightful question like that. So whatever that your values are, you should go find an employer that shares those values and have mentors that shares those values as well. And you should be demanding of yourself to expect that and to find it. And until 
until you do, don't go work at that place. Now, easier said than done. You need jobs, you have loans to pay off, you have bills to pay. I get it. Maybe that's not the first job, but you should, that should be your North Star. Because I can tell you, as big as the real estate industry is, there are that many assholes in this industry. And you have to be really careful who you're working with and who you're working for, because people who don't share your values will create environments exactly the way you describe. Frankly, I'm negotiating with a guy who's selling a building to me right now, and he fits the profile that you're trying to avoid. And you can't avoid jerks in your life. But you can control what you can control. And I would say that there are environments, work cultures out there that are very supportive, that are very um, mentoring, that, that will share your values, and you should go find them. This is great, David. Thank you so much. And Amy asked another great question that I want to get to as well. Um, she's curious about the ethics of real estate within modern efforts to further affordable to further affordable housing in Chicago. Um, and the question is around how do you balance the critical need for affordable housing with our drive to optimize profit in real estate? And if I may, sorry, I would just say too, I'm coming at this from the uh, the the perspective of a social policy student, like I plan to be a politician. And I'd be curious, like from your perspective within the real estate agency, how can we create effective policy that might be accommodating of the need to to emulate in excuse me, to propel profit within your industry while also servicing our our constituents, you know? Amy, I love that question. Thank you for asking it. It's something I spend a lot of time uh, working with um, local political leaders, uh, community stakeholders, community groups all the time on this issue. And I'm going to tell you what I tell them. And by the way, by way of background, I will tell you that I built the first mixed market building in Hyde Park in 50 years, uh, about seven years ago. It's a building called City Hyde Park. And we did an 80-20 deal with the alderman at the time, Tony Preckwinkle, who's now the Cook County uh, um, president or commissioner, whatever they call her title. Uh, and Tony was a real leader uh, uh, in that space about it. And what I would say to you is what I say to them, which is you have to be serious about it. And, you and, and by being serious, you have to bring value to the table. We have a massive housing crisis in this country. This is not just a Chicago issue. This is everywhere issue. For all the reasons we're not going to spend, we don't have time for this morning to discuss why. Let's just, for discussion purposes, all can agree that it exists, that there is a housing crisis in this country. The way you can balance affordability and profit making is one through mixed market buildings that can be successful, but the municipalities have to be partners in the deal. There are many ways to do it. You can do it through height. You can allow a guy like me build higher than you would otherwise build because the offsetting revenue compensates the developer for the risk and the cost of building those affordable units. From a economic standpoint or a financial standpoint, there is no developer who would ever build on a market rate basis affordable units because there's it, it, it doesn't financially work. You would lose money doing it. It would cost a million dollars to build the apartment and it would be worth 200,000. You wouldn't, there's no for-profit maker who would ever do it. But the idea that mixed market buildings can be anchors and strength, strength in communities is very real. And it should be an aspiration for all of us. And the way you do it is through all these different tools. I just mentioned height, I'll mention a few others. Um, a lot of times you have, we did, we actually on the building I just described to you, we did a TIF district, which is a called tax increment finance which is a really interesting program. It's not a subsidy for a developer. You take a, an unimproved lot that's undervalued or underutilized. Let's say it pays taxes a year of $100. And you have a developer like me come in and say, I wanna build a new building and the new building is gonna improve it. And now when we're done, it's gonna have taxes of $1,000. Well, the city says, great, we're gonna let you do that. You put in affordable housing. And for that $900 of increment, we're gonna subsidize your cash flow for that for the next 20 years. So the city gets, 700 of it, the development gets 300 of it, but you've done it by expanding the pie and creating value. You're not taking money from taxpayers. You're taking money that's being generated through value creation. 
that's an incredible tool, but it's a lightning wrong in communities because they think you're subsidi subsidizing development and for-profit development, when to me, it is a wonderful tool to go create affordable housing. You can do it through pilots and, and other ways. You also, we had a great partnership with the Chicago Housing Association as well. You know, we had a lot of tenants in our portfolio that were CHAC. You know, you can, you can help you can help residents who can afford up to a certain rent level and then cover up to the market or a discount to the market to help support affordable housing in high quality market rate housing. The problem is, but for these things, you end up with underfunded, undercapitalized, older buildings with horrible conditions. That is the problem. The housing stock is too old and there aren't investment dollars to help improve those those buildings. So this is a building that's near and dear to, to my heart. I, I'm bringing the first voluntary uh, mixed market building uh, to get developed in Pittsburgh right now. We just got approval for it 30 days ago in a neighborhood there. So uh, I'm a big proponent of this and I would encourage you to pursue your career to, to partner with developers and community members to bring value to the table. It's a super important issue for our country. That's great, David. Thank you so much for getting into that. A question from Amy, and I love hearing, you know, the policy side and those considerations in this real estate space. And we got into the nitty gritties around some of the finance space. If students have questions coming from a different perspective, please feel free to pop those into the chat, whether it's me in a private chat or in the public chat. This was a really interesting turn in the conversation. Um, and David, you know, we've talked a lot about risk and taking risks. And I know you mentioned the starting a company, you know, when your wife was pregnant. And I want to use this as a case study and kind of uh, learn a little bit more about how you assess risk, because we have students who are assessing their own risk, right? Post-graduation, you mentioned needing jobs to pay rent, pay different things, et cetera. Um, can you walk us through, you know, the taking on that risk and how you evaluated what you considered in that moment. Yeah, so that's personal risk. And I will tell you that I was, well, I am so very blessed to be married to an incredible woman, but uh, she was incredible then too. And we were very fortunate that she had a job that uh, could support us, frankly. Uh, you know, she paid our bills for a year. When you start a company, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen like a, like a fighter jet take off of an aircraft carrier. You know, the first thing that happens is the plane drops to the water because it doesn't have enough power. And then it quickly climbs and, and, and ascends. That's what it's like. And so you need a lot of support to go do something as risky as I did. Uh, and so, you know, you might hear me say we all the time because I didn't do this alone and she was... My partner in this in every single way because you know we believed in what it could be for our future and our family. Um, so there's no part of this is easy. Uh, I I had a, a very fortunate circumstance uh, that I that my wife had a job and made enough money for us. To, we, we cut back hard on a lot of things and you know we made some stuff happen in my business in the first year and we sort of made our dug our way out of the hole. But um, it's not easy. And so what I would tell you, if you're really that if that kind of entrepreneurial mindset, uh, you know, you got to go into it with a lot of resources and a lot of support. And that could be from, you know, a mentor that could be from a network that could be from other investors before you get started. Um, I would imagine most of you are in a position in your life right now where you're, you're just looking for a job and that seems daunting and intimidating enough. And so I would just say, Go get a great job, not easy to do, but they're out there for great people. And you all are incredible candidates, I promise you. I see I see resumes every single day and you are uh, a super talented, qualified bunch who will do great wherever you land and, um, and go after that and, and build your career more incrementally in terms of developing skill sets so that when you're, you know, when I, when I left, um, Casey, uh, I had seven and a half years of, of investment banking experience and I had three years of law school and I had one year of life experience, you know, like I didn't just walk out into the world and announce the world was ready for me. I mean, my mother-in-law you referenced was like, are you doing something new or special? And I said, no. And she said, no one else does what you do. I said, no, tons of people do what I do. And she said, are you smarter than everyone? And I said, absolutely not. 
And she said, do you have some trick that no one else has? I said, no. And she goes, you work at a big place. Something good happens in your bank account every two weeks, right? And I said, yes. And she said, have they ever missed or forgotten to pay you? And I said, never, not once. And she goes, are you out of your mind? You know, like, why would you do this? You're an idiot, you know? I thought you were smart, you're dumb. Um, so my point is that I had a lot of a foundation before I took that leap and it was hard enough. So you you all probably aren't there for that move yet, but, but you know, build your skill set first. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure some students uh, on the call also have, you know, some experiences with parents saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I know- Don't listen to them. Do, do, yeah, do not listen to anyone who says no to you ever. You have to, you have to believe in yourself and, and be a contrarian. Listen to that voice in your head. Do not listen to what anyone tells you. And I love that, David. I know we have about one minute left, but I know one of the questions we often hear from, you know, parents and, and loved ones is, you know, what are you going to do with a degree in history? And, and, you know, and people probably wouldn't think necessarily after this talk that you majored in history from the work that you're doing. But can you just share, you know, some advice for those students who are really interested in an area where, you know, philosophy, religion, history, you know, students who are uh, majoring in the non-traditional um, things to go into finance. Can you share some advice on how history has helped you? Yeah, let me, that's a great question. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'll just try to answer it in two parts, okay? I'll try to condense what I would say in two things. The most important thing that I would tell you is be curious. If you're any one of these Weinberg majors that I would describe, you already are, okay? So congratulations, you're already there. There is a level of curiosity that you need to be successful in anything that you do, and you're already doing it by pursuing the majors that you have in Weinberg. So for me, it was history, but for you, it's whatever it is. So that is fundamental skill that you cannot teach, that you have to have to be successful in a, year, in a, in a career, in any career as far as I'm concerned, but certainly in a career of, of real estate and finance and so forth, okay? because it, it will make you better at what you do. So you may think you're studying about, you know, the, the Mamluks and the Ottoman Empire, okay, which was a course I remember uh, well, but, you know, learning about that civilization and why it succeeded and why it failed and who were the players and what were the incentives and where were the conflicts and, you know, what made it happen? Like that level of curiosity and rigor that you will someday apply in a job will help you be successful on any project you ever do. That's part one of my answer that I could talk about for a long time, but I won't. Part two of my answer is the study of humanities in a way is uh, uh, an investment in your soul. You know, you're, you're, you're developing yourself as a person that will allow you to one, be a well-rounded, articulate, intelligent, insightful, informative, interesting citizen of our world. And if you read the newspaper or social media, we need more of you, okay? You're gonna save everything that we and my parents screwed up. We're counting on you, sorry, but we're counting on you. That's number one. The second thing is about that idea of, of, of the humanities is you know these, these other students that are so vocationally driven, I will tell you two things. One is they are going to be way ahead of you on the first day of your job. OK, way ahead of you because of the skill set they're developing, because they're they're being bred as like, <laughs> I don't want to use a bad metaphor. They're being bred to be great financial analysts day one, ready to work day one. You are not. You're probably doing things to supplement your career and skill set. And you should ignore all that noise. It doesn't matter. You're in this for the long game. And what you are learning and enriching yourselves by studying history or these other subjects will carry forward with you for your entire life as a person. There's a level of analytical thinking, rigor, curiosity, writing, problem solving, analytic, that all that you need to be successful. And the last piece, the last thing I'll say is you got to be a good person because everyone wants to work with good people. And so you developing this part of your life and this part of your personhood is really important and it will show in an interview it will show when i look for people i want to say are they going to get along with my teammates are they going to add to our community and our culture here or not 
Are you interesting or not? We just hired an analyst, okay? And this kid is a fascinating kid. And, and I hired him because I know he has the potential to be great on the skill set. I'll train him. But I hired him because he's a really smart, curious, hardworking kid. And he's going to do great. Sorry if I'm not used to use the word kid. But sorry, I'm an old person. That, that is who he is. And he's going to, he's joining us, you know, in a month. So anyhow, good luck to you all. If I can ever be a resource for you, um, you know how to reach me or Casey, you should just share my contact information. It's fine. Um, but I wish you luck. I've been there. You can do it. You're going to do it. And uh, it's a real, real honor for me to talk to you this morning. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, David. I loved closing with that answer around the humanities and history. Thank you so much for your insights and advice throughout. Students, please join me uh, in thanking David for being here. I know, David, you're logging in from your phone, but we're getting lots of thank you messages okay. in the chat. Um, and students, thanks for being here. We will send out a, a follow-up message with David's LinkedIn profile so that you can you know, stay connected, reach out, thank him for joining us today. Um, and we will share Grubhub credits with you all because normally we like to buy students food um, during our panels and we can do that through Grubhub on our virtual programs. So David, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day and go Cats. Thank you. Go Cats.